Okay, so the, the next uh, lecture is like a, a small tutorial on, on PyTorch. And uh, what I will try to cover is first some of the basics of PyTorch and then how we can use this framework to train your model. So the training process we already discussed, like uh, the high level, the conceptual uh, idea behind it, but we will look into like the code, the, the specific code, which is uh, used to do that. And later in the tutorial, you will see uh, which will be like hands-on tutorial, you will see like the actual code running uh, for, for that process. Okay, so let's start with the basics. Uh, there are like a uh, lot of, lot of uh, deep learning libraries out there. And again, this is just a very uh, small list. And daily you will see like different, different frameworks are being um, developed for different applications. And so we have Torch, we have PyTorch, TensorFlow, you might have heard of, then we have Theano. And I'm not sure if like people still use Theano. And again, these are all variants. Uh, so PyTorch is something like, which is considered like the easiest to, to follow because it's, it's it's based on Python. And it's like, uh, I think uh, it, it has a very good documentation as well. TensorFlow, it's, it's very powerful, but again, if you, if you don't have expertise uh, in deep learning or coding, then I think you will struggle a lot. So in that sense, I think the PyTorch is something which has a very like, you will say like a non non steep uh, learning curve. Okay, and that's why we, we chose uh, PyTorch. And uh, we have we have uh, said it earlier. It's up to you if you want to use a different framework. If you have expertise, perfectly fine. But then, like uh, whatever tutorial we are going to have, whatever help we'll provide, it will be mainly focused on PyTorch. And that doesn't mean we will not help you with other frameworks. We will, but that could be like limiting and limited, and maybe not as extensive as PyTorch. Okay, so in PyTorch, we have tensors and these are same as like you use NumPy arrays, okay? The only difference is these tensors can also be used on a GPU. And why we need GPU? Because we want like faster computation. If you don't use GPU, you just use your CPUs for training. It will take a lot of, lot of time. And you will, go, go, you will, you will experience that when you are uh, doing your programming assignment too like the difference between CPU and GPU. So these GPUs are uh, usually people used to uh, develop these for like playing games and video rendering and all that. But these days, all uh, you, you all know that they are very, very useful for training these uh, deep learning models. And the, the reason is like they are, they have like very, very optimized computations, metrics multiplications, which makes the uh, computation very, very fast. And I think so far you, you I think you must understand that Inside your network, whatever you do, it's most of the time it's like matrix operation, right? You're either you're multiplying matrices, you are adding matrices, subtracting matrices. So we, we have like very, very optimized code for that in uh, for GPUs. And I think CUDA is something, a library which actually uh, enable that. So let's try to understand like what are different uh, variables available in PyTorch, which how they relate to like uh, what you have in NumPy and how, how they can be useful. So first of all, if you're using PyTorch, you will have to import this uh, Torch library. So that's a standard you do in uh, Python as well. If you want to create a random matrix, and this matrix could be like one dimension, two dimension, or multiple, it, it can have any, any dimensions. So you just call this function torch.rand and two cross three is just telling you the shape of that matrix, right? So this is like a two cross three matrix. This is a three cross three matrix. And like uh, like Python, you can also just print these values, and it will give you like what what is uh, stored in on these variables. Okay, so this so far so good. It's pretty simple. Uh, the way you do in uh, Python as well. The only difference is like uh, how you actually initialize these. Okay. These will give you like uh, tensors in the, in the form of matrices. Now let's say if you want to create like a array or a matrix which has all zeros. Again, you can do dot, uh, dot zeros. Again, this is same as you do in uh, Python uh, or using NumPy. And you give the shape. Okay. You can also initialize your tensors directly from data. And the way to do that is you use like this ten tensor API and you give the values. And this is going to create like a one dimensional vector which has these two values. Okay. And this is like, I think pretty useful when you're actually creating or you're designing your architecture, you need to debug like, okay, what's the size of the tensor at this point of time? 
So this uh, variable or tensor dot size can give you give it that value. And again, this I think function you also have in uh, NumPy. Now let's quickly uh, go over to uh, different operations uh, which can be done. So we'll cover the basic ones. Of course, there are a lot more than this. This we have seen like how to create two different uh, matrices. Okay, so these are two different tensors. If we have to add these, you can just call torch.add and pass these as variables. Okay. And again, print, we'll just print the values. Indexing is something like very powerful uh, coming from Python. The same indexing also applies for PyTorch. And if uh, and as I said, like Python was a prerequisite, so you should know uh, all of this already. It's just, uh, I think the new piece of uh, information will be, this can also be done in PyTorch, okay? So what this operation is trying to do here is, if X is a four cross four matrix, you are actually indexing uh, the, the first dimension, or you can say like the first row of the second dimension here, and you are taking all the values in the first dimension. Right, so this is going to give you like a one dimensional vector with four values. Resizing is also very useful. I think when you um, design your network, uh, you will see like it's, it's very useful uh, at a lot of places. Let's say this is your vector. And this is a little complicated, uh, but not, not that hard. Okay. So if this is a four cross four matrix, then you know that this will have 16 different values. And let's say you want to convert this matrix into a one dimensional vector. So you can do that using this view uh, function here. So view is something like what's the target shape you want. In this case, it's telling you the target shape is 16. And Y will be just like a one dimensional vector with 16 values. And those 16 values will be coming from this uh, four cross four matrix. And you know this has 16 values, so you can do this which means that not all operations will be valid for view. You will have to make sure that you know how many elements you have in your input data. Okay. So this is like another very interesting use of view. Again, it will be very useful. What it's trying to do is, so this is x dot view, which means that we are, uh, which means that we are trying to reshape the, the x tensor over here. And the shape is when you have negative one, it means you don't care. All right, so it's like something you can, uh, the, the, the library will automatically compute for you. So whatever this number is, you don't care about this. So that's for, that's negative one. And eight is something you're saying the second dimension should be eight. Now you know that this is four cross four, again, two dimensional matrix. This is again a two dimensional matrix. Second dimension is eight. So automatically the first dimension will be two, right? Because this has 16 values. So it has to have uh, two values that will make it eight cross two sixteen, because you can't like change the number of values you, you have in your matrix. Right? So that two will be automatically computed by by the library, and you just put don't care here. And again, you can print like the the sizes. So x dot size, you know, it's a four cross four. Y since uh, you reshape it to like a one dimensional vector, it will have sixteen different values, and z. Uh, you put like a two dimensional matrix where the third, first dimension is don't care. That's going to give you two cross eight. Okay, slightly complicated, but I don't think it's uh, very complicated to, uh, to be. All right, so now let's try to compare like torch tensors versus, num versus NumPy arrays. I mean, so far you have seen that whatever you can do with NumPy arrays, you can do with uh, torch tensors. So that more or uh, less like uh, true. Now NumPy arrays, whatever computation is happening, it will happen in the CPU, okay? One big, biggest difference why we need tensors is because tensors will allow you to perform those computations, whatever those computations are, multiplication, addition, on the GPU, which will be much more efficient, okay? That doesn't mean that you can't do these, uh, you can't use these tensors on CPU. Of course, they will allow you to do computation on CPU as well, but in addition to CPU, you can use them on GPUs. Okay, so torch dot, uh, torch dot once, uh, uh, five is the uh, dimension. So that will give you like a uh, five dimensional, uh, one dimensional vector with five different values. It's one, so all will be one. And this allows you to convert your NumPy array to torch tensor. And again, this will come very handy because you'll have to like uh, go back and forth. It might be you want to work completely on NumPy because you're 
operations are being done on CPUs. And then when you want to start like training of a model, then you want to transfer all of those NumPy arrays to uh, PyTorch tensors. Okay. So to go from to go from PyTorch tensors to NumPy array, you just do like your tensor dot NumPy, then B is going to be uh, a NumPy array. A was a PyTorch tensor. You can do like the other way around as well. For example, if you have like a NumPy array, then you can call like torch dot from NumPy. So in this case, A is your NumPy array and B is your torch tensor. Okay, so these are like, I think two handy uh, functions you will need. Now, this is like the basic uh, operation, the matrix multiplication, as I said, like most of the time when you are transforming your activations in inside the network, you are actually performing matrix multiplication. And of course, I mean, the whole reason behind having those frameworks is you don't have to write these mat uh, matrix multiplication operations. All right. So that will be automatically done by the framework for you. But in some cases, you might have to uh, write this. So let's try to understand uh, how this is done. And again, so you're creating two different matrices, two, two, uh, two cross three, three cross three. So you can just call torch dot matrix multiplication and matrix one, matrix two. It will just multiply. And you can see that like you have to have like compatibility between these two matrices. So these two matrices are compatible and the resultant matrix will be of shape two cross three. Okay. So the requirement was the number of rows in this should be equal to number of, uh, number of columns in this should be equal to number of rows in the second matrix which is like three in um, both the cases, okay? And you can see like the uh, size is actually two cross three. Now, we we don't multiply matrices like just independently because you train like on batches. Uh, so you, when, you, when you train your model, you have like a mini batch, right? Let's say 16 samples or 32 samples. So then it also allows you to actually perform matrix multiplication in batches in this case, we have a batch of 10. So this could be like 10 different matrices, each of shape three cross four. And the second matrix, uh, it's, uh, it has a shape of four cross five. So then again, you can multiply these two in batches. Again, you have a simple BMM function here. So the result of this operation will be, again, you will get like a batch of 10 because each sample is independent. And when you multiply these two, this is the common axis. So the resultant matrix will be three cross five, which means that you will get 10, 10 different matrices and each matrix will have a uh, shape three cross five. Okay, and there are like a lot of other uh, operations. So this was just for a starter. And most of these, you won't have to worry. I think most of the time, uh, just addition multiplication will do the job for you. Uh, concatenation, again, this is, uh, I think, very useful uh, when you design your network. So if you have two different vectors, you want to just concat them, and it's a basic like concatenation operation you do in, uh, Pyth uh, in Python as well. So you can just concat two different tensors. And then you have squeeze and unsqueeze operation. Let's say you want to get rid of some of the dimensions in your matrix. Let's say you have a five dimensional matrix and you, you want to get rid of let's say third or fourth matrix, uh, third or fourth dimension, which only has a single value. And so that, that will like excuse squeeze, right? Squeeze and then you unsqueeze it like you want to expand the matrix or you want to increase the dimensionality of a matrix. So again, you use uh, unsqueeze for that. And of course, like a very good documentation is available uh, at this link. You should uh, definitely refer to that uh, for more uh, complicated tensor operations. Now let's try to understand with all those tensors, what will actually happen when you're actually building your neural network or your convolution neural network, how the computation is being done. Okay, you're just importing the torch library. You create a variable which is like a matrix two cross two. Let's say this is your input variable. And let's say you have another variable Y. Again, uh, it's two cross one, which means it's just two different values. Another variable, so I will just uh, quickly go through what these variables are. So let's say this is your simple neural network architecture. And the idea is X is your input data, which is defined by this uh, variable over here. And W is the network weights. All right, defined by uh, this line over here. You can see that the, there's an argument like requires grad equals to true. This means that this actually is a acronym for require gradient. 
when it is true, which means that this is like a learnable parameter and this is a parameter of a network, okay? Because these are weights and X and Y are not because this is like data which will flow in the network. So you're multiplying X with, uh, with the weights, all right? And that will give you A and B here represents the biases. So what you do, you know, like the normal neural network uh, formulation, if you write the equation, that should be like, if Y is your output, then that y should be equals to x times the weights and then you add the biases to those so this is like a very simple formulation for a for a uh, for a neural network and if you write this using a uh, pytorch you'll have to define all these variables okay and then you can just write one uh, one line code over here so this is torch dot matrix multiplication which is, which means like you're multiplying x with uh, with the weights plus you are adding biases and then you are applying like the sigmoid activation on this output and that's going to give you the p which is the network's prediction so this simple one line actually defines a neural network for you okay so pretty simple then the next part is you need a loss function and again don't worry about like this uh, complex equation here we will we'll talk about like uh, lo loss functions later so this is a simple cross entropy loss. I think we have seen this equation before, so it might not be uh, difficult to understand for you. This is the same formulation, same equation. So loss in this case will be, uh, you know, that uh, this is the ground truth. This is the prediction. And again, this is the ground truth. This is the prediction. All right. You can just uh, write, write the uh, loss function here. And your cost will be, you just average your loss. Because if you have, let's say 10 samples, you will compute the uh, loss over all these samples and take a mean, okay? And then you have to uh, minimize this cost to train this network. Okay, so let me put all those three uh, over here. So this is your neural network, which is taking X as input, W are the weights, B are the biases, and again, B are kind of weights as well. And this is giving you the loss function. So based on this prediction and this ground truth, you can compute the loss. You are just averaging the loss over multiple samples. Then what you do is you just do a backward call. Again, this is a library function provided to you by uh, PyTorch. And all the chain rules we studied, the backpropagation we studied, everything is being taken care of by this single function call. So you don't have to create uh, compute gradients. You don't have to perform like those simple steps. Everything will be taken care of by this simple function. So what this function is doing is it will take this loss value and it will compute gradient for all the variables in your network. Okay, and basically it will compute the gradient one by one, right? And it will use the chain rule to go backwards. And once uh, you, you run this backward, then you can see like, uh, what is the value of the weights and what are the values of the, of the biases? So when you train this thing, over different samples, these values will be changed. All right. And of course, like Y is your ground truth. So you don't have to worry about that. You will provide that uh, to train the network. And X is again your training sample. So you will provide that. So the only thing which is being trained is the weights and the biases. So this is like a very simple formulation, how you can train your uh, a simple maybe neural network using PyTorch. But again, you can easily generalize this to like your more complex CNNs which you are going to develop. But of course, that process is not going to be this complex. This was just to give an idea like uh, how this can be done very easily. with. Uh, so the next segment is about uh, model training, how we can use like whatever we discussed uh, about PyTorch tensors and all those functions, how we can utilize that to define our architectures and how we can uh, train that architecture. We just look at the toy, uh, toy example. Of course, that was a very simplistic view. We'll have to build like uh, more complex uh, architectures to actually solve real problems. So let's go through the full training process. Uh, when you will solve any problem, you will have to follow these steps. Okay? The first step is you'll have to define the neural network. And the idea is like, whatever problem you have, you should know what will be the input. You should know what will be the output. Okay. So based on those two pointers and also like how big your, net, uh, your network should be, and how many layers, how many parameters there should be. So you will have like some, you will use some experience and make some judgment calls. 
define all those hyperparameters like number of kernels, size of kernels. Okay, most of that will come with experience. So don't, don't worry about that. But the first step is define the neural network. Then the second step is you will have your training data. And to train your model, you will have to go through each sample of your training data, right? And then train your network. And as we discussed, we do that like in batches. So the idea is you will have to iterate over your training samples batch by batch. Okay, so you need code for that. And we'll go through like how, how to write uh, that piece of code in PyTorch, which will iterate over all the samples and give your network batches. And your network will be trained on those batches. Okay, so the third step is once you have that piece of code which can give batches to your network, then, then the question is how that batch will be processed by your network to produce the desired output. All right. And once you do that, you get the desired output, then you should know how to compute the loss. So we'll use that prediction and you will define some loss functions. And that loss function will make use of the ground truth, which you will, know, which you will need to compute the, uh, to, to train the model. Uh, the, that's also called annotation that you will compare with the predictions and compute some kind of loss. Once you have the loss function, then you will have to compute the gradients. Okay, so that gradients will do like the back propagation, the back flow into the network to update each and every parameter inside your network. And once you have computed all the gradients, you will use those gradients to update the weights. And if you think about this, in all of this, the actual training is happening in this uh, last step, which we have on this slide, update the weights of the network. That is the code like when actual training is happening, when you're changing the weights values. All right, so let's go through each of uh, these steps uh, one by one. The first step is to, uh, to build the neural network. I will give you like a simple, uh, simple example, again, which you can easily generalize to like more complex architectures. So PyTorch provides you a package which is called a neural network. So torch.nn for short. Okay, now what you need in your architecture when you write the code, and now we are talking about like uh, the actual coding. Okay, so just, just bear with me. I, I understand it can be complicated to understand code like through slides, but I'll, I, will, I will try my best. So what you do is you actually need some kind of forward function which will do the feed forward operation for you, right? So given the data, it will perform all those transformations to generate the output, okay? So for that operation, you have this uh, neural network.module uh, function or library which you can use to actually create all the layers in your network, okay? And then this is like very, very specific uh, function which you will always need. So whenever you're defining your neural network, neural network you will always need, uh, need a function which will be named forward. Okay, we'll, uh, we'll talk about that, uh, what exactly that function looks like, but just keep that in mind. And that forward function will take the input, which is like your data. And this function will, define like the steps as your layers inside your network are actually transforming your data to produce the output. So this is actually the core of your architecture. And that's why we need this like uh, this function. Okay. So, so that will uh, do the forward function. And for the backward, we really don't have to care about this because PyTorch has like a very efficient uh, way to do that. And uh, we have AutoGrad, which automatically finds uh, the gradients for you so that you don't have to compute the gradients for each and every variable. And what all we have to do is like just call this function. Okay. So if, if you call this function as, as I showed you earlier, right? so it will do it automatically for you. Don't have to worry. So the only thing we have to worry is about forward function where we are defining the architecture, the actual architecture of our, of our model. Okay. So let's see how we can do that. Uh, I will probably, we will not be able to cover like even this part, but I will just give you like some uh, high level idea. So you need to import these libraries, which is fine. Uh, nothing special here. You will define a class. And again, you need like, you need to understand what, what classes are in Python and the assumption is you already know that. So we're not going to talk about what the class is in Python, right? 
because this was a prerequisite. So, but I assume you know, but again, if you don't know this, reach out to me, write to me an email. I can sit with you uh, separately to explain you this. But we, we will we'll define a class and we'll define like, okay, so this net is like name of your architecture. You can use any name you want. The only thing is you'll have to inherit this uh, neural network dot uh, module, this package. So this is like fixed, you can't change it. The only thing you can change is the name of your architecture. Again, you will need like an initializer. And again, if you, you should be aware of this, what this init is. But this is something, whenever you create an instance of this class, this function is automatically called. Okay, so that's just programming basics. So this will be called, and again, nothing new, you will always have to do this. And this is again, a very standard step. So you're just using this, uh, the name of uh, your class, whichever, you, whatever you defined here. Okay, so again, this is initialization. We don't have to worry about it. Then what we'll do is we will create like layers inside this initializer. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about that, how to do that. And these layers are something you will first define them. And once you have defined them, then you're going to use those layers in your forward function. Okay, so as I said, you need a forward function, which is mandatory. And the X is going to be the input. So whatever input you have for your network, that's the variable X over here. And then below this, like in this function, we define what kind of transformations you want to perform in your network. So that's the bare minimal you need. And as I said, you don't need to worry about the backward function. So this will be the basic structure of your neural network architecture. Okay, so whatever architecture you create, you at least need, need this uh, bare minimal. Okay, so maybe just uh, uh, we can take a pause here and uh, we'll talk about like uh, the next steps uh, in the next lecture. So let's move on to the lecture. And I think this is the uh, last segment of PyTorch tutorial. And you also, uh, you, you also had a tutorial like a uh, hands-on experience today uh, during office hours. So the final uh, segment is uh, model training. So first, let, let's quickly go over like the full training procedure uh, we use uh, to train your uh, deep networks. The first step is you have to define your neural network. Then the second step is you have a training set. You will have to iterate over all the samples you have in your training data. Okay, so you. You, your network should see each and every sample in, in, in that set. And you do that in batches. So you will select like one batch at a time and uh, that's process for your network. And then for each batch, when you process, you, you compute a loss. So that's like the fourth step. You, you will need to compute a, uh, the, the network's loss, how good the network is doing. And depending upon how good the, good the network is doing, uh, which will be determined by this loss function, you'll have to compute derivatives of the, the network parameters. And that will tell you like how much you should shift like those values. So that will be like the back propagation step. All right. And then once you have estimated like, okay, what should be the adjustment? You make that adjustment, which is called updating the weights. So let's uh, go over like each uh, of these steps in, in more detail. The first step is to define a neural network and we, we covered that briefly last time, but I'm going to go over uh, again because it's kind of connected. So in a neural network, you basically have two steps. One is forward. The second is uh, going backwards. So forward is you have your data sample. That data sample is passed as input to your network and whatever function you have as your network. So those transformations will be performed on the input. So all those transformations is called the forward uh, function, or you can say like feed forward, which is going to give you predictions. Okay. So for, for this forward, you need actually a forward function. And we'll talk about like, uh, you, you need, uh, you, you, you actually need a class. And in, and in that class, you need this forward function, which will take the image as input or your data as input. And it will return like the output of the ne network. So this is actually the core of your network whatever functionality you have in your network is defined in this function forward. And of course, like whatever you're using in this function, you can have some helper functions for that. Okay, the second is backward. And again, this backward is the actual training when you update your uh, weights. And the good thing is when you use these existing frameworks, you don't have to worry about it. So we have libraries which can automatically compute the gradients for us. 
and they can automatically update all the weights for us. We just have to call those as APIs. So the idea is, again, these are like some basic uh, libraries you'll have to import. So you import Torch if you have to use those functionality, and then you have Torch.nn, which is like neural network. And this is a very basic step, and you will always have to use this. So some of this will never change whatever architecture you're defining, and some of this is like dependent upon what architecture you're defining. So we'll cover both. For example, like class, uh, again, this is a Python keyword. You're just defining a class in uh, Python. So it will have to be inherited uh, with nn.module. Okay, so this will never change. We'll always use, use this argument. And net is just the name of your architecture. For example, we studied LXNet, right? So it could have been LXNet if you're defining LXNet architecture. So this is just a name. Then uh, you should be aware of this uh, because uh, Python was a prerequisite. So this is just an initializer of this class. Whenever you will create uh, uh, an instance of this class, then this initializer is actually called. Uh, and again, you should know, know that. Okay, so and again, you're just calling the super. So again, this is an initialization of the, of the inherited class. So again, this is all, uh, it, it has to be there. It, 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 won't, uh, it won't be changed, it's standard Python. And this is the most important function which we'll have to more, uh, pay more attention to. So you can not you can change the name as well, but again, um, it, it's good if you don't because uh, PyTorch assume that the name of the function is forward. But if you change the name, then you'll have to make some more changes to the code. But uh, if you use forward, then PyTorch will uh, automatically take care of this. It will assume that, okay, this is your network feed forward step. Okay, so this X is the parameter, which is like the input to your network. If it's an image, then X will hold image data. Okay, and in this function, you will define like how the transformations will be performed on this input data X. Okay, and we don't have to worry about back, uh, backward. So let's see like how we can define like a simple architecture. For example, if, if we consider this CNN, we have seen this architecture before. It takes image as input. And then we have like several convolution layers, subsampling layers, and finally fully connected layers, and then the prediction. So let's try to define this network using PyTorch. And this is like the whole code I'm showing you uh, at once, but I will go through this uh, one by one. But if you clearly, if, if you uh, try to skim through this, you can see like you have a class, you have the name of the function, and some of the things which we discussed. And this is the initializer, this is the forward function. We will talk about like what we have in initializer. And again, we'll talk about forward function. And this is just a helper function, which we need, uh, I think, in the forward function. OK, so this is like how a uh, standard neural network architecture looks like. And this piece of code is actually defining this architecture over here. OK, so let's try to understand each and every line of this. Let's start with the initializer. So again, as I said, this is like standard Python. Don't worry about this. Now, in initializer, what you do is you define your layers, which will be used by the feed forward function. All right. So whatever layers you want to use in your forward function, you will have to first define in PyTorch. Okay. And it, it, it will vary from framework to framework. For example, like if, uh, if you're using a Keras uh, framework, in Keras, you don't have to define these. Okay, you can just use them like uh, which are available in the framework itself in the forward function. In PyTorch, it's, it's slightly different. You have to define this first. And that's actually good because if you have to modify like <clears throat> some of those layers and you, you want like uh, some kind of flexibility in defining the layers. So since you are defining, so it's actually good. But if, you, if you're sure that you don't have to do some advanced like uh, architectural modifications, in that sense, Keras is actually much better than PyTorch. But again, uh, it's kind kind of a uh, subjective uh, uh, subjective discussion, so let's not go in that direction. So what we do, we define all the layers which are required in the forward function, and this is one of the convolution layer which will be used later on. And this is just like the name of the layer. Okay, we say that as con one. That's the name, and this is actually uh, defining that layer. So nn is the uh, the the package which we imported from uh, PyTorch. Con 2D is 2D convolution. Okay, so we are defining we are defining a 2D convolution layer here, and it has three parameters. So let's go over like what these parameters are. The first parameter is the depth of the activation map 
coming from the output of the previous layer. Okay, and since this is the first layer, in, it's actually not the first layer uh, in the initializer, but we are going to use it as a first layer in the forward function. And again, since we are designing that, we know uh, we know that. So we're, we are going to use this con one as the first layer or the input layer. Then we know that we are designing this architecture for grayscale images, right? And grayscale images, we know that the number of channels, it's just one. And the spatial shape is 32 cross 32. Okay, that's the re resolution, but it's a grayscale image. And that's why we put this as one, okay? So the second is how many kernels you want in this current layer. Okay. So this is six, which means that this convolution layer will have six different kernels. Okay, so far so good. The third parameter is defining the shape of the kernel. Okay, so six kernels and it's saying three, which means you are not you're you're not worried about like the shape of the kernel. So by default it will be a square kernel. So if you say three, it implies three cross three. Okay, you could have written like three cross three explicitly here, which is also fine. But if you're just saying three, it's three cross three kernel. So what this uh, line of code did is you have now a layer which is named as con one, which is a 2D convolution operation. The input to this layer will have like some kind of activation map, which has depth of one. And this layer will have six kernels and each kernel will have a shape of three cross three. Right, so, so far so good. Then let's define another convolution layer. The name is con2. Again, it's a 2D convolution layer. And it's saying that whatever activation map is being passed as input to this layer, it will have a depth of six. And we are saying six because then the idea is we'll use this layer after con1. And con1 has six filters, right? If you have six filters, then the output at activation map will have depth of six. And that's why the input to this layer will have a depth of six. 16, we want to use 16 kernels in this layer. And again, three, we want to use kernels of shape three cross three. Okay, so that's good. Now, let's try to add like a fully connected layer. And this is just like a flattened fully connected layer where you have to define like how many neurons you want. So again, this is FC1 is just a name. And the library function you have to call is nn.linear. Okay, so this is called linear layer. And let's go through the parameters. So if you think about fully connected layer, it has some set of uh, it has some set of neurons, right? And it will it will it will receive like uh, again a set of neurons, and then depending upon that, uh, you will have certain set of weights, and you will do linear combination of each of the neurons to generate the output. Okay, so this linear layer has two parameters. This is the first one and this is the second one. Okay, so uh, before going to the first one, this is slightly complicated, but not, not that difficult. And I think this answers the question uh, one of you were asking uh, when we were, uh, when we were uh, starting the lecture today, right? So let's go over the second parameter first. The second parameter says, in this fully connected layer, you will have 120 neurons. Okay, simple. So you will have 120 neurons. Now, this first parameter is saying how many neurons you have in the previous layer. Okay, so it could be any number, but I will come to come to that, like why we have 16 cross 6 cross 6. So this is like the total number of neurons in the previous layer. So now you have neurons in the previous layer, you have neurons in the current layer. You can just multiply these two to get like total number of parameters you need for this layer. All right. So now let, let's talk about how you get this number 16 cross 6 cross 6. So it will depend upon a lot of things, basically two different uh, parameters. Okay, The first parameter will be because before this, we have a convolution layer and you know that output of a convolution layer is like a feature map. Okay, It will have a, it will have a cuboid shape, X and Y, that's the resolution and it will have, it will have a depth that depth will depend upon how many kernels you will have in this convolution layer, right? So you can see that in the previous convolution layer, we have 16 kernels. So which means that the output of this con2 will have depth of 16. That's why we get the 16 here, okay? 
then these are x and y which is like the resolution of the activation map so since it's a cuboid and to feed it into the fully connected layer you'll have to flatten it which means you will have 16 times 16 uh, 16 times 6 times 6 neurons in that uh, feature volume which is exactly like the number of neurons you you need in that layer okay now the question is how you got 6 cross 6 and again so this second term will depend upon what is the input of your image and you know that given an input image if you are performing convolution then you are going from volume to volume and if you don't use any padding and if if you depending upon like what stride you have <clears throat> what padding you have the shape of the output volume will change okay so in this case we are not talking about padding and stride at all which means like we are just using the default values so whatever shape the input image will have let's say it's 28 cross 28 after this con layer it's just saying that the shape will be 6 cross 6 and that's how you compute the number of neurons in the previous layer all right now let's define another fully connected layer li uh, like this so again the name is fc2 and n dot linear and this is number of neurons in the previous layer which we know is 120 and 84 is the number of neurons we want to be in this particular layer let's say 84 and we have one more fully connected layer which is fc3 again n dot linear and again 84 is like number of neurons in the previous layer which we know is 84 and 10 is like in the current layer which which says that this could be the classification head and we want 10 different predictions so this 10 comes from that okay so this is the initializer and this is just defining these layers now we will use these layers to actually construct the architecture and that will be done in the forward function so the input uh, to forward function is your image x it will have certain shape for example if it's a binary image it could be 28 cross 28 cross 1 or it could be just 28 cross 28 okay now this is the first operation and this is kind of a like uh, compressed writing but but don't worry about it because you know that your your layers are just functions right whatever output you have from one layer that will go as argument to the second function so you can always write that as chain of functions and that's what uh, this uh, line of code is doing so let's start from uh, the top x is the input and you're using the first layer self.con1 which we defined in the initializer right so this will actually perform that convolution operation which means it had how many six six kernels right and three cross three so whatever operation we know like convolution layer will perform that will be performed and output of this layer is passed to a relu activation so you can directly use like f dot relu again f is like functional api imported from uh, pytorch so you can directly call this a relu activation which means that this activation is applied on the output of your first convolution layer all right then again output of that activation is then passed to a max pooling layer so this is how you call max pooling layer okay so you don't have to define max pooling layer and the reason is we know that max pooling doesn't have any any parameters right and same is the case with relu we don't have any parameters that's why we don't have to define uh, them in the initializer of course you can define them and then again use it but there is no point because we don't want to learn any parameters there right so then whatever output you have from the relu activation you will perform max pooling operation uh, on that and you, you, you can see here that uh, we have a second parameter or you can say second argument passed to this max pooling operation first was the data itself and second is the shape of your kernel to be used for max pooling which is uh, two cross two okay so i think two should be uh two should be like the the shape of the kernel all right so which will be like two cross two and the second two is uh, the stride uh, you will use so you will skip one pixel and then you move forward so these are just parameters to your or arguments to your max polling function now which means that let's say if your input is 28 cross 28 right so convolution will i think change that to 26 cross 26 i guess right you, you can do the math but just like a rough uh, estimate how we got that six cross six so if the input is 28 cross 28 uh con will get to 26 cross 26 relu won't change it 
and max pool 2d again it's uh, 2 cross 2 and stride of 2 it will give you i think uh, 13 cross 13 all right so it means that shape of this activation will be 6 cross 13 cross 13 6 is coming from the number of kernels you have in this con layer because uh, neither relu nor the max pooling is going to change the depth of uh, that activation map okay now again this output x of this max pooling is being passed to this con2 layer which is the second convolution layer and again this is i think you had 16 or something kernels right 3 cross 3 so that i think will give you again 12 cross 12 after this so the shape will be 16 cross 12 cross 12 and then relu it, it won't change the shape and again max pooling 2d it's the same operation we did here and you can see like the shape the shape is 2 cross uh, it, the argument is just 2 which means i think the kernel size is 2 cross 2 so that 12 16 cross 12 cross uh, 12 cross uh, 12 will go to 16 cross 6 uh, 6 cross 6 so this x will have a shape of 16 cross 6 cross 6 and that's how we got that 6 cross 6. now what we are doing is you know that we are just trying to reshape because output of this is going to go into a fully connected layer and we know that fully connected layer everything should be flattened you can't send in like your uh, a cuboid shape or something something like that okay so this view is actually <clears throat> is actually changing the shape of this x the shape of x is 16 cross 6 cross 6 and it's trying to flatten it so it's saying like the first dimension i don't care whatever it is okay so now you know that what this negative one means but the second argument is it's trying to compute the number of neurons in x okay so this is a helper function number of flattened features which again we have written in this class and it's doing nothing it's just trying to count like how many values you have in that uh, in that volume so if this volume x is 16 cross 6 cross 6 it's a cuboid right we know that it will have 16 times 6 times 6 values so this function will do nothing it will just return that number okay and this is going to be the best size which you will use so don't worry about this right now but this will give you 16 times 6 cross 6 and then again you will send that as input to your fc1 and you know that uh, this one has i don't remember how many neurons but the input was 16 cross 6 cross 6 that's how we computed that and again you can have another fully connected layer this x will go here and then finally you can make prediction so at the end this x stores like 10 different values and each value will tell you whether that particular object category is present or not okay so that's how you go from your image to making predictions about that image and this predictions is going to tell you like whichever prediction is actually the highest you will say okay this object category is present and that's a very that's like a very simple uh convolution neural architecture it has two con layers two relu activations two max pooling layers and three fully connected layers okay so it's not that difficult you can see like a lot of uh, code reuse is happening here and then finally this forward function will return x again which is the prediction so that was the helper function i was saying so this piece of code is doing nothing it's just trying to compute the number of neurons you need or number of values you have in in, in that cuboid right so i can quickly walk you through this but i think it's pretty uh, straightforward so this uh, x dot size again you know it's it will give you the size of uh, that feature vector and this is slicing which means that you're ignoring the first axis which is always the batch size so you ignore this and consider all the other so what will happen is if your batch size is let's say 10 then the actual shape of x will be 10 times 16 times 6 times 6 and this size is going to return that but this slicing is actually ignoring the first dimension so size here the variable size will actually store 16 cross 6 cross 6 okay and in this for loop you are just actually multiplying those three values and you just return that value okay it's just a helper function and you can have as many helper functions as you need in your architecture so that was pretty simple and you, you saw that when you, you defined a neural network okay now let's see how we can iterate over the data set and that that uh, that batch you actually uh, get from your uh, data set how that batch is actually passed to your architecture 
So I think there are a lot of different variations here. And this is, I will say, is the most complicated part when you have to train your network or when you have to design your network. And this is called data, you can say data pre-processing or data preparation. And I think from my experience, if you take like your effort as 100% in working on a deep learning project, if uh, you are not like very expert, then most of the time, almost 90 to 95% of the time is going to be like spent in data preparation. So again, for uh, even for data preparation, we have a lot of, lot of libraries. And like, for example, for text, we have uh, these uh, NLTK is very, very popular, Spacey. So again, you don't have to write everything from scratch. Uh, I think a lot of libraries are uh, available. So which makes your uh, task easier. But again, this is, uh, I think, a very, very challenging task. Okay, for, for audio, we have Spicy and Librosa. And of course, um, it might be outdated list. So there might be like some new libraries which are actually more efficient and you know, easy to use. Again, for OpenCV, I think you might have used in the first assignment as well. So you can use OpenCV in PyTorch as well. You have Pillow and then I think PIL is there. A lot of, lot of other libraries available. Okay, so the idea is when you are working with your data, for example, your images, then your images, they are stored in your disk, right? And then you load those images into memory and it, it starts with CPU memory. Okay, so you will store those as NumPy array and then you have to convert those NumPy arrays to GPU tensors before uh, being able to pass like those images to your network. And we know that how to convert NumPy arrays to GPUs. I think we briefly touched upon that. But even before that, I think that's, that's the easiest step. The difficult uh, step is like how to load that data into NumPy array so that it's actually prepared for sending to your networks. Okay, so this step is called, uh, you can say different terms. It could be like uh, data loading or you can say data loader. Okay, the, the idea is you are actually loading your data from disk. And there are a lot of challenges so if you're working into image uh, in on images or videos, one big challenge is the 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 requirement of memory, right? It requires like huge amount of memory. So you will have to do that efficiently. The other issue is, I think if you have uh, if you have taken like operating system course, you know that disk I/O is something like which is the biggest bottleneck in computation uh, any computation process, right? because reading or writing into disk, it takes a lot of time. It's the actual like hardware operation, right? So same is like, I think it's one of the bottleneck uh, we have in uh, deep learning as well. So most of the time what happens is GPUs are not the limit. And of course, like there are different variations, but let's say you have like uh, sufficient memory in GPU. So it's not that processing the data from your input to output. So that all of that is done in GPUs, so that's pretty fast. So you don't wait for that. Most of the time you wait for loading data from disk. Okay, so again, there are a lot of optimizations uh, to be done there, but still I think that's uh, that's one of the bottleneck. So for, uh, I think in PyTorch, we have TorchVision, which has, uh, I think a lot of uh, interesting functions which you can use, which makes your uh, data loading extremely easy. And again, I think this is, uh, you, you will understand this better when you start coding. And when you will start like doing your uh, second programming assignment, some of this, uh, some of this you might have seen in the tutorial today as well. So I will try to quickly go through this, and if you have any questions, we will uh, come back. Okay. So I think one important operation which you have to perform in your data is transformation. Okay. So this transformation is you might have your data in some format to prepare or to convert or to transform that format into something which your network accepts. So there are a lot of variations there. One actually important parameter is what should be the resolution of your image, right? Because you you can't like use any image uh, out there. I mean, if if your if your images are have like varying resolutions, some is like thousand cross thousand, so, some is hundred cross hundred. So your network won't work that way. So when you're designing your architecture, you beforehand decide, okay, this is the image resolution I'm going to use, and the most important ones are like. Uh, we use either 112, 112, and we can use 224, 224. Okay, so these are like the, some of the standards. And so what you have to do is, if your image is, let's say, 512, 512, you'll have to first change that resolution to, let's say, 256, 256, something like that, right? So all that operation, it's actually 
it, it's time consuming because if you think about this changing resolution of your image, it's it requires interpolation. Okay, even if you have to increase the resolution, it requires interpolation. And if there is interpolation, you mean you have to compute that linear, uh, you, you have to compute that linear combination for that, right? So it's uh, computationally expensive. And so transform has like a lot of different functions which can be used to actually. So again, resizing is one of them. Then other operation, I think cropping is used. Then a lot of augmentations are actually used if you want to rotate your image or let's say if you want to maybe perform some kind of scaling function in the image. So all of those transformations, uh, this torch vision dot transform is actually very handy. Okay. So the way is, I think this is just one sample example which you can use. And I think if you just use this, like for all the projects in this course, that I think will be sufficient. You don't need uh, anything else. Okay. So this, this is like you are actually preparing this transformation operation. And this is a function which will be applied to all the images you load from your disk. Okay, so you don't have to worry about like applying to each and every image separately. We just define it, uh, define it as a callback function. So, and you can select certain arguments here. So this first one is actually transforms to tensor. It's helping you move your data from CPU to GPU. Okay, you know that two tensor actually moves from CPU to GPU. So if you call it here, if you use this transform, then all the data will be automatically transformed to uh, we will move to GPU memory. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. This is pretty important. Then again, the second is transforms dot normalize. So this is actually making sure you normalize your values. Okay, so for example, if your RGB images are in the range of zero to two fifty five, you might to normalize it between zero and one or negative one or one. So whatever normalization you want to perform, you can just define it here. So for example, I think this normalize function you have two different two different uh, arguments. The the first one should be like the mean values. Okay, so mean values for R, G, and B. And these three, I think, could be the standard deviation, right? So that's like one way to normalize. But of course, you can have different ways to normalize. So you can just replace that with uh, this function. Okay, so now there are two things. When you're working on a data set, it could be like it's a well-known data set, which is already like established in the research community. In that case, your life is actually easier because these frameworks, for example, PyTorch, they actually have like functionality to directly use those data sets without being without worrying about like creating new data loaders. So for example, CIFAR 10 is a very popular data set for image classification, which it has like 10 different object categories. So you can just use this torch vision library to actually load this uh, data set. All right, so then don't have to worry about anything. Okay, where the data set is located, like how many images you have, like what's the training set, what's the test set, everything will be taken care of by this, by this API. And this is just the location, I think, where uh, the data will be downloaded if you don't have that. And train equals to two, again, this is like the training data, Download to if it's not there, I think this API will download for uh, for you. So it's a very nice uh, API. And this is the transform which I was talking about. So if you define like a transform callback function like this, and you pass that transform uh, callback function to this argument, so all these transformations will be automatically applied on all the images of this data set. Okay, so you don't have to worry about it. So it's pretty clean. All right, so this is like transformation. This is you're defining your training set. And this is the actual data loader, which will be used to actually load your samples from disk and pass to the network. OK, so you have this data loader API for that. And this data loader will take like the train set, which you just created. OK, and again, this was a known data set, so you were able to do this. But if it's a new data set, you have your own data set, you will have to take care of generating this data set. Okay. Then batch size, I think very important parameter, like how many samples you will have in a single batch. It's four in this case. Shuffle equals to two. Again, it's, it's a very important parameter. You always want to shuffle your samples. So what, what will happen is you will have your training data. So it will be a long list of images, let's say, right? So what you want is if you're selecting a batch, then if you don't shuffle the order, 
then what will happen is in the first iteration, your network is always going to see the same set of images in that batch. And then again, we were, we were talking about co-adaptation, right? So if you have that scenario, then what will happen is your network is always seeing these set of, let's say the best size for these set of four images as a batch. Okay, so it's kind of, the, it might co-adapt within those uh, samples. So what we want is in different epochs, we want like a different combination. So that's why if this shuffle equals to true, then whatever list you have in your uh, training list, the order will be randomly shuffled, which will make sure that every iteration actually sees a different combination of samples. Okay. And the next parameter is like number of workers. So probably I will say, don't worry about this. This is more of like increasing the speed of your data loader. It, it just tells you like how many parallel threads you want, which will actually load data from your disk. If this is two, then you will have like two different threads, which will load the data in parallel. And as I said, like data loading is one of the bottleneck. So you want to use like as many workers as you can. So your network or your GPUs won't have to wait just for loading data from disk. Okay. So that was for uh, training. Similarly, you can have your test uh, test set. It's almost the same. The only difference is train is equals to false. So this API is going to give you the test set. As I said, I mean, this is a known data set, but if you write your own data set, uh, you'll have to take care of that. And again, this is exactly the same uh, piece of code. It's just like you will put shuffle equals to false because during testing, you don't want to shuffle your uh, samples. Right? It doesn't matter actually because you're just doing inference. Okay, so that was uh, about data loader. We'll, we'll talk about that uh, later as well. I know it's like a, it's a lot, but bear with me. Don't don't get confused. Okay, so now processing input through the network. It's a pretty simple step. Once you have defined your network, then what will happen is your data loader is actually giving your network image samples in batches. If batch, let's say the batch size is four, so this input to the forward function x is like four images. Okay. For example, like the scenario which we were discussing, the the shape of x will be four times one times twenty eight times twenty eight. Okay, and that 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 batch will be passed through passed through all these layers to produce the output. So that's just a feed forward step. And once you have that feed forward feed forward step, so then you have the output from the forward function, right? And you can use that output to actually compute the loss. Okay, and of course, as I, as we discussed earlier, there are a lot of uh, variations in in, lo uh, in loss functions, and you can have like mean squared error as loss. You can have binary cross entropy as loss. Okay, so we'll we'll talk about some of these loss functions later, but we have uh, also discussed these as some of these as well. So then the idea is let's let's try to put uh, some of uh, those uh, components together. Net was a class you defined as your uh, architecture. And let's say input is the batch which your data loader is giving to uh, is, is going to provide. So that data your net will take and it will pro uh, produce this output. If the batch size is four, then the shape of output is going to be four times ten, right? Four is the batch size. Ten is like uh, ten different classes. So in this case, I'm just generating like a random ground truth. So you know that uh, torch dot random will give you ten different random values. So this uh, will be the target in this case, but of course, for your uh, problems, you will have certain ground truth again, which will be stored somewhere in your disk. You'll have to load those and you will store that uh, in, the, in the target, okay? So again, you are changing the shape of the target. Okay, so which means that uh, your batch size is kind of one and you're pushing all the 10 values to the second dimension. And in this case, it's assuming that batch size is one, but if batch size is four, you, you can have this as four, then you will have to have four more values here as well. And this is how you define your loss function. And again, nothing fancy, you don't have to do anything. You just need to understand like what kind of loss function you need for your problem. And you just define this criterion, again, the NN package. And if you want to compute mean squared uh, error loss, you just call this function. And it's pretty straightforward after that. You just pass like two different values to your criterion. So one is what the network is predicting. The other is the ground truth. In this case, output is coming from the network. 
and target is the ground truth. In this case, we randomly generated it, but of course, we'll have to load this from disk somewhere. So this is coming from annotations. And this criterion will automatically compute the loss function for you. Again, you don't have to worry about it. Of course, you can write your own loss functions as well if you if you want to uh, have some custom losses. Okay, so I think that until this point is like the mo most complex thing we, we which we have covered. The next steps are like pretty uh, straightforward. The backward is uh, API again. You compute the loss. You call backward on this loss. It will automatically compute all the gradients you have in the network. So in, in fact, that's like the most complicated thing when you train your network. And again, you don't have to worry about it. So which is actually pretty cool. Okay. And again, once you have computed the uh, gradient, then you just you just like update all the gradients. And again, it's a simple uh, one line. It's optimizer.step. Okay. So let me quickly go through uh, this. So you know that when you have computed gradients, it's fine. But what will be the equation to actually make that update for each parameter? We What we studied was stochastic gradient descent, that equation which was using learning rate or maybe momentum, right? But there are a lot of other uh, optimizers out there. So you will have to define the optimizer, what optimizer you want to use. And for this course, don't worry about it. You can just use uh, SGD for all the assignments. And there are a lot of other variations as well. Okay, so this is actually defining a very simple stochastic gradient descent optimizer. And the parameters are like all the parameters of your network. And this will actually return all the trainable parameters of your network. And this is a learning rate. And as I said, like this is a very important factor in your optimization step. And again, this is something there is no formula to actually get this value. You will have to empirically determine this, uh, this value by running multiple experiments. Okay, and this learning rate is something which is very important when you are defining your optimizer. So this is just SGD, but you can define other optimizers as well, as I said. And I think we have some optimizers where even you don't have to worry about the learning rate. So that optimizer can automatically figure out the learning rate for you. And of course, when it, mo it might not work like for all the other scenarios, but we do have the, uh, those options as well. All right, so once we have the optimizer, so when we are designing SGD, what, what it's doing is, so you remember that equation, right? You have the current value and you subtract like the learning rate times the gradient. So it's just defining that simple equation, nothing fancy. Okay. So this step is you will have to first, uh, so this is just like making the uh, gradient value zero because inside your network, you have a lot of trainable parameters and to store the gradients for each parameter, you have some variables which will store these gradients, right? So it's just actually making those values zero before starting. And this step you have already seen for any given input, you will produce the output. Criterion, you will already have the loss function which we described before. You will give like the target and the output and you will compute the loss. And when you call this loss.backward, loss .backward, this is actually computing the gradients, all right? Now, this is the actual training, optimizer.step, when your parameters are being updated. And these parameters will be updated based on that simple equation which we discussed for SGD. We have the learning rate. This step is going to give you a gradient for all the parameters in your network. All right. And then this step is actually just updating them all in parallel so that you don't have to worry about it. Okay, so these two steps are actually the core of network training. But again, it's really nice that you don't have to worry about it. You just call these two functions every time. And the, these two steps are never going to change. In fact, these three steps are never going to change. Okay, whatever network you, you define. Unless you are doing something, something fancy. Okay, so I think the only missing piece right now is like uh, the, the full picture how you get your input and how like uh, the model is being trained like every epoch. So let's quickly go over that and uh, then, then we'll take questions. So you define your network, all right? So this net was the class in Python and that's how you instantiate uh, different objects, okay? So then this is your network. And of course you can instantiate like this class multiple times. That's the beauty of class in Python. So in any programming language, you can have net or you can have another network here using the same class. So you can have multiple networks of similar type. 
then you define your data loader this we briefly go over uh, before so you'll have to pass your training set we'll have to define like what's the batch size shuffle will be true for training and how many uh, workers you have okay so that's your uh, training uh, loader and this loader is actually going to give you batches of your data so you define your uh, your loss function in this case it's saying cross entropy loss which is fine if you are doing classification then you will use cross entropy loss and this is defining uh, optimizer sgd okay in, in this case we are also passing uh, value for momentum if you don't pass then the default value will be used i think the default value is actually i think 0.9 for sgd okay so this is the actual uh, network training you will decide like how long you want to train your network let's say you want to train for two epochs which means that your network will see every sample of your training set twice all right so then this this loop will be run like twice and in each loop we are going to watch your network is going to watch all the samples once okay so this is just you are maintaining some loss value and the inner for loop is actually going over your training data once so this is the train loader which we defined earlier when you iterate over this train loader it's going to give you batches of your images okay so i is just like a uh, 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 index right which enumerate will give you should know that that from python and data is your your batch of images which this train loader is going to return okay so in this case exactly if you will have to compute like the shape of this data this is going to be four times one times six uh, 28 times 28 considering your batch size is four and you have a grayscale image of shape 28 cross 28 okay so that's your batch and after this, you know me, you just take this data and pass it to the, to the network. And your so this, this loop is actually doing one iteration of your training, which will include like feed forward pass and backward pass, which will include like computing gradients and updating the weights. And you just repeat this for loop. Okay, so data, you will have inputs and labels. Oh, sorry, I missed the labels. So this input is your batch of image, but of course you need the ground truth as well, right? which is like for each image, what, what is the ground truth to actually compute the loss? So that's actually all is packed uh, in, in, the, in this data variable. So which is fine. Then you zero the gradients. Okay, then your forward step, backward step, and then you finally optimize. So this is the forward step. You pass that input to net, get the outputs. This is you compute the loss function. And this is the backward step where you compute the gradients. And this is the optimizer where you change the values of your network parameters. So that's like one step of network training. So that, that's it. Okay. And these are like just uh, logistics. I mean, if you want to monitor your loss, like how your loss is uh, increasing, decreasing. But again, this is just some plain Python code. This is just bookkeeping. You don't have to worry about this. Okay. Let me skip that. And eventually, once your network is trained, what you want to do is you want to save your network weights, right? So it's like for each trainable parameter, you will have to uh, save it. And that's a simple function, torch.save, which will uh, save this state dictionary. So it's a dictionary because you have name for your layers, and then you will have name for every kernel in your, in your layers, right? And then those will have some learned weights. So you have that dictionary. So you can, in fact, like just try to print these network uh, prints just for fun. Just try once, like printing this dictionary. It will give you like exactly all the all the parameters you have in your network and their corresponding values. Okay, so that's training and testing is similar. The only difference is you only do feed forward step to get the predictions. You don't worry about computing gradients and updating the network weights. So we've defined test our data order earlier. So similarly, you are iterating over your uh, testing samples. And so again, this is like a, it, uh, you can select like iter, right? So each time you do next, it's going to give you your batches. And you can pass these batches to your uh, train model. And again, this is just creating instance of that uh, class, the, the network you have. So whatever weights you have saved in your disk, you can again load those using this function. All right. So this, these are like the train weights. And then you just do the forward pass. And this output will tell you the, the prediction from the network. So that's just testing.
And you can use like these outputs in whatever way you want to compute accuracy, precision, or whatever you want to do out of that. All right, so that's the complete training process. And the so that was on CPU. And if you have to train your model on GPU, all you have to do is you'll have to define your device. Okay, so this function will just figure out like if you have GPUs present in your machine or not. If not, it will fall back to CPUs. If yes, then it will uh, have, have that uh, information in device and you just uh, forward your net to that GPU device. Okay, so again, this data is also going to go to device. So whenever you have to send like data from CPU to GPU, so this is another way. And we, we have seen like another way like the two tensor function, right? So that is also fine. This is also fine, but you have to make sure like whenever you're training your network, everything should be on GPU. Okay. For data loader, you don't have to worry because your transform. Uh, oh, you're okay. I think my bad. So earlier I think in the transform function, when it was doing two tensor, it's not actually sending to GPU. It's just converting NumPy arrays to uh, PyTorch tensors. Okay, sorry, that, that was my bad. So it was just converting. And of course, you can use PyTorch tensors on CPUs as well. And this is actually sending your, your networks or your data, your variables to, to GPUs, considering that you found this device here using this API. Okay. 